Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yep. Right, let's start. Uh, welcome to this session. We're going to speak about HTTP2 and the Java and the environment around HTTP2. I uh, hope it will be a very interesting session. Uh, before we start, let me ask you here like a quick poll. Um, who's a web developer, actually writes uh, HTML and JavaScript and stuff? Okay. Who's a deployer, a guy that actually puts this web application into production. Okay, so, and who's taking actually the decision of how to put this stuff into production, like whether to use TLS, SSL, or uh, whether to, you know, make secure decisions or change things and that. Okay, phew, all right. Okay, let's start. Um, my name is uh, Simone Bordet. I work for an American company called uh, Webtide. Uh, which has been acquired by another American company called uh, Intalio. Uh, we employ, we are the Jerry committers, and uh, we work for this company. We provide open source uh, support for the Jerry server container. Um, let's go into the presentation straight, and uh, let's see why do we need HTTP2. So this is the page of the W3C.org in 1996. <coughs> Uh, in, coincidentally, that year was also the year that the HP2, HP 1.0 release was out. So uh, it was this page, um, 600 bytes only, and just one HTML file. That's, that was the web 20 years ago. Um, well, fast forward to today, and this is the current uh, 2015 page. It's made of 41 resources for uh, 366 kilobytes 
uh, one HTML for CSS to JavaScript 34 images. So this means that basically the same, this page has become four times more resources, 40 times more resources, almost 60 times bigger in download size, and uh, it is not even close to the average web page that we have today in the web. Uh, let's take, for example, the CNN.com page. This guy here comes at a hoping 95 resources, 6.7 megabytes of download just for the front page. And uh, you get uh, 3 HTML, 4 CSS, 30 JavaScript, that's not bad, eh? but JavaScript frameworks, and 58 images. So, what happened in these 20 years? Well, this is what happened. The web exploded, and uh, HTTP 101 is an old protocol. It has been designed 20 years ago, and for that kind of pages, one HTML5 in 600 bytes. Um, it is very inefficient. Why? Because it doesn't have multiplexing. You have to open multiple connections to actually download stuff efficiently. And uh, it is so inefficient that developers started to work around the limitations of the protocol by using hacks. Who of you knows what is domain sharding? Ah, just a couple. Okay. Who, has, um, who knows what resourcing lining is? Okay, a few more. All right, so all these hacks, uh, domain sharding is a technique where browsers are only allowed to open a, a fixed number of connections to a domain, right? So the HTTP um, specification recommends two. Uh, browsers do not respect that. They open six. Internet explorers open eight. And why they do that? Because they want to download stuff in parallel from the website. If they have two requests from, from the same website, instead of you know, making one request, waiting for that request to come back, and then make the second request, they just open two connections. They make the request in parallel, they get the responses in parallel. right? So it's an optimization. So they can make up to six requests in parallel, or eight in, for Internet Explorer. But that's not enough, because when you have 90 or plus resources in your page, perhaps most of them hitting a single domain, then even eight is not enough. You have to you know, count how many times, how many round trips you have to make if you open just six connections to a domain, and you have to download 90 resources from there. Um, so what they do is, uh, okay, let's do domain sharding, let's trick the browsers, we put all the images into images.domain.com. We put the CSS into css.domain.com. We put the JavaScript into javascript.domain.com. The browser thinks that all these domains are different, so it opens six connections for images.domain.com, six for css.domain.com, and so forth, right? Unfortunately, they end up all in the same server, <laughs> typically. So what happens is that a single browser opens you know, tens of connections to a single server. Just one browser. Maybe in CNN.com it has millions of visitors. How many connections do they have to care? So, why browsers do this? Because they care a lot about, about the user experience. And uh, we will see that this is really important. And um, they really want to be fast. Why is that? Well, this is the reason. Uh, these are five examples of what changed for these companies to make their websites faster. All right? So let's go into this. Shopzilla, they basically moved the load time of a page from 6 seconds to 1.2. They actually made uh, an increase in revenue of 12% and an increase in page views of 25%. You increase the speed of your website, you get 25% more people visiting your websites. Um, Amazon.com, 100 milliseconds they estimated that 100 milliseconds decrease in page rendering yields a 1% increase in revenue. Imagine Amazon.com, they're making billions, right? So 1% is a huge number. And 100 milliseconds, just for, for, to give you like a perspective, when you close your eyelids, it's 300 milliseconds. So 100 milliseconds is a super fast time. Still, we can feel this 100 millisecond difference, so much so that we stay on Amazon website more, and we buy more stuff in there. 
just because of 100 milliseconds difference. American Online, um, they noticed that the visitors that they were receiving pages faster, they were staying on or visiting pages 50% 50 per, uh, 50 more than the visitors that were receiving the page slowly, like the low end. Yahoo increased uh, uh, the traffic by 9% just by shaving off 400 milliseconds of page views. Mozilla.org, they shaved 2.2 uh, seconds from the front page. That directly turned into 60 millions more downloads of the Firefox browser per year. Like imagine this number, it's big money, right, for all of these guys. And so it's for you. It's like if you have a slow site, um, you're going to pay for this. You're going to lose money. Did you know that Google page ranking is also based on page speed for your website? So if you have a slow website, you end up in second page in Google search. And second page means nobody will find you, right? So it's not only a matter of, you know, yeah, okay, the site is more usable, it's faster, etc. It actually means money. Either you save it or you make it. But in either case, it's a lot more money. So uh, something had to change. And as HB101 was a very old protocol, people started to get you know, interested in trying to build a better protocol that didn't have all the constraints that the old protocol had. So let's take a look at how HB2 works. So HB2 is a binary protocol, not any more free text. Um, it is based on a previous protocol from Google called Speedy. Um, but being a binary protocol is very efficient to parse and generate. Um, it is based, instead of being based on free text, and by free text I mean, imagine I'm a server-side developer, I'm actually an implementer of an HTTP server, right? Imagine what I have to do when I have to parse an HTTP header. I have to take a, a character, a single character, and say, hey, are you an end-of-line character? No. Okay, let's take the second one. Are you an end-of-line? No. End-of-line third, fourth, oh, are you a colon? So, okay, all the characters before the colon are the name of the HTTP headers, and then let's go forth until we find the end of line character, right? Um, in HTTP2, we changed all that, and we say, oh, okay, you know what? Here's the name of the, of the thing that you're going to pass, uh, sorry, is the length of the thing that you're going to pass. It is 58 bytes. So we read 58, and then we know that we have the next 58 bytes are the stuff that we need to, to read. And that has a huge impact on performance. As I was saying, HTTP2 is based on frames, so it works in this way. There's a single frame called the headers frame that contains the request headers. It's like a small block. It gets sent to the server, and if it's a post, it's followed by a data frame, which also contains the data that you want to upload to the server in your post, for example. And the server replies in the same way. It sends down a headers frame containing the response headers, and then um, data frames that um, contain the response content for you, like an image bytes, or HTML bytes, or whatever. How does it work, actually? Um, well, there's a big, big change, especially um, if you listen to the um, keynote from yesterday from Ola. Um, he had a very strong um, uh, idea that the, the web must be secure. And uh, this was translated into the HTTP2 specification as well. So basically, HTTP2, it's a protocol, but the implementation of this protocol done by browser vendors especially um, implied that you have to use TLS to work, to make HTTP2 work. What that means to you that if you don't have HTTPS on your website now uh, and you want to go there because it provides you uh, speed improvements and performance improvements, then you have to think about buying a certificate for your websites. Right? Uh, not only this, but the HP2 specification said that the current TLS version is 1.2 and of the, the security ciphers, so the algorithms that are used for encryption in TLS 
only one was actually good for HEP2, right? So they actually are even more advanced than what the current TLS specification says, and uh, they really want to have strong encryption for HTTP2. This, however, poses a problem for what they are called transparent proxies. Um, a transparent proxy is basically a machine that sits between you and the final server and can do usable stuff for you. For example, can do caching for you. Instead of going back to the server, doing the database query, etc., he can cache the, pa the page and returns that back to you. Now, I was talking to people that are, is involved in um, making internet more available in uh, third uh, world countries, like, for example, most Africa. They have huge prices for mobile connections in there. Um, they pay a lot. So, transparent proxies there make a big difference because instead of going to the server, downloading the whole stuff, maybe it's not JIT-zipped and whatever, um, they can actually make the cost uh, smaller because they go to a closer server and that server can actually download uh, uh, content that is already compressed. So they'll pay less for, for the traffic that they generate. This is not possible anymore with TLS because all the traffic is encrypted from the client up to the end server. Right? HP2 does have a support for clear text um, support, but this is mostly used only for server-to-server -server communication. No browser, up as of today, supports clear text HTTP2, right? So you have to go HTTPS, no matter what. Another big benefit from the HTTP2 protocol is that uh, it's now multiplexed. What, what does this mean? That you can actually send multiple requests in a single TCP connection. You don't have any more uh, the, the need to open multiple connections to a single domain to actually go in parallel. You can just open one connection and then you show inside as many requests as you want. So it works in this way. The big blue pipe is the TCP connection and whenever we send a header frame to the server, we create a smaller pipe, the green one, um, that's called uh, a stream. And, uh, you know, this is one request from the client to the server, but we can immediately send and create another stream for another request, and then another stream for another request, right? These are created in this order. But then the server can actually decide which one is fastest to be um, responded to. So it can actually say, well, this one was the last one that was created, but for me, for the server, it's the fastest one to serve. So I can immediately start sending back the data, right? These ones do not have to wait or, or, or you know, there's no order. Uh, the responses come down out of order. But they are related to that particular stream, so the browser can figure out what responses for what request. So continuing this, you know, this could be totally out of order. I and mean, this is how multiplexing works. It doesn't stop here. Uh, HTTP2 does uh, HTTP header compression. Um, imagine every time you send a request to the server, you're sending a large string, which is almost 100 <coughs> characters long, which is the user agent string. It says what kind of browser you have, what kind of privacy systems, and so forth. It's a very long string, and it gets <coughs> sent every single request to the server. Imagine cookies. If you have large cookies, then these get sent every single request to the server. Right? So what we can do is, and what it has been done with HTTP2, is that we are now compressing those headers. We're compressing them so efficiently that basically we can save up to 85% of the space that the headers take from a normal request in HTTP1 to a normal request in HTTP2. <coughs> so what happens is that we save bandwidth. Imagine thousands of billions of requests per day for very high traffic sites. Imagine how that saves in cost of bandwidth if you have your website deployed on a cloud where you pay for the traffic that you, that you generate on your cloud. Right? Um, there's another couple of features. One is called request prioritization. I just mentioned here, but it's, it's, it's a controversial feature. It may help clients, but um, I'm not going to talk much about this. We will see how it develops um, 
between client implementations and server implementation. One big um, new feature that we have in HTTP2 is called push. This is not related to uh, what, what's called server push. It's actually the push of correlated <coughs> resources. Let's see how it works. So it works in this way. In an old HTTP 1 to 1 scenario, what, how does it work? We have a client, we have a server. A uh, client makes a request for index.html, right? So it makes a request, comes <coughs> back. Browser starts parsing index.html, and it finds that it needs to download more stuff. It needs an application.javascript file and a style.css, right? While it's parsing the HTML. So it makes a second round trip. And since it has to make two requests, it opens two connections, other two connections, because the HTML may still be downloading, right? So it opens another two connections. <laughs> but, you know, it can make those requests in parallel. Then um, they get back these and start parsing <coughs> the CSS and the JavaScript. And it turns out that in the CSS, you have an image, a background image. So you're going to make another request to the server, probably open a fourth connection to the server, uh, to download the image. Right, so we make three round trips uh, to download the main page, like just the page. So um, if your server is uh, in America, so you have to cross the ocean from here, and it's typically you know, 150, 200 milliseconds every round trip. And uh, to render this page, it takes 600 milliseconds, basically, more or less, mm -hmm. right? Considering that you have no problems with the network, it's very fast, everything is optimal. However, the server can say, well, you know what, whenever you ask me for index.html, I know that you're going to need application.javascript, style.css, and this image. They are related because they're part of that page. That page is composed by those four resources. So they are correlated each to each other. So what we do in Jetty, uh, but other servers can do similar things, uh, we can build a push cache. And uh, we put this correlation inside the cache. And when an HTTP2 browser comes in and says, hey, I want index.html, we can do this. We can say, well, you asked me for this, but I know you're going to need these other things as well. So we make one request, but we actually send back five responses to the client. Okay. This takes one round trip only, and it's much, much more efficient. We'll see a demo about this later on. Uh, hopefully, yeah, I'll have time. Um, so, okay, that's super cool. Did I convince you that HTTP 2 is much better than HTTP 2 1? I hope. And um, when is this happening? Um, well, it's already happened. <laughs> that's the point. So, the HTTP 2 specification is under a, uh, like a process called the IESG editing, which is basically the final step before getting an actual RFC number that defines what is the HTTP2 specification. Uh, the IESG is um, the committee that actually works uh, together with the IETF to standardize network protocols over the internet. So it will not change uh, unless they find some big security hole, but you know, the spec group, which we were part of, has been very careful in analyzing those, and uh, we believe that there's no uh, fallacy so far. Of course, uh, security is a complex issue. And the uh, browser have already implemented HTTP2. Like, for example, if you have, uh, who's using Firefox here? Half. It's, it's already there. It's already enabled by default. When you go to Google servers, you're not talking anymore HTTP 101, you're talking HTTP 2 already. You go to Twitter, same. Facebook, probably same. You go to webtie.com, our own website, you're speaking HTTP 2 served by Jerry. Okay? Chrome as well. Chrome is not enabled by default yet, but it's probably going to be in the next version. So uh, I'm now on 41, probably 42 will have HTTP 2 enabled by default. Internet Explorer 11 is implementing HTTP2 as well. I um, don't know if it's enabled already by default, but it, it will soon be. So clients are ready. Like we make these three browsers, we basically made like 95% of the, the clients over the internet, right? And the major websites, all of them are moving to HTTP2 because 
there's a reason for that, and the reason is money. Again, <laughs> they're making more money with this. <laughs> so they're totally interested in say, okay, I'm going to leave the old craft behind because I want to be on the edge on the new stuff, and uh, you should do that too. So how about tooling and, you know, what tools do I have to, to work with HTTP2? Well, um, you know, I, I'm from the Linux background, but, you know, uh, Curl, Wireshark, I mean, basically you have all the tools you want. I mean, um, you, you, can, you cannot anymore do, I don't know if anyone did it, this telnet, host 80. <laughs> did you do that? So, and, and then you were typing text in there, you know, hitting enter a couple of times, and boom, you had the request sent to the server. You can't do that anymore because HTTP2 is a binary protocol now. But uh, all the other tools that you have, like curl, wget, wireshark, and everything, uh, they do support HTTP2 already. So you probably have to, you know, look up your Linux distribution, pull down the latest version of those libraries, but it, it's not far away. Uh, in this page, there is a list of implementations. There are 35 plus implementation of the HTTP2 protocol, both on the client and the server that are listed. Uh, you can find basically any language. You can find Java, C, C++, Go, Node.js, Erlang, Gaskell, Perl, Python, uh, you name it. Uh, it's there. It's probably there. So um, it has already happened. All right. Now let's go to the Java side of things. Um, what do you need to do? Now I'm scared, okay, I need to move to HTTP2. It sounds great, it's, uh, there was this guy at this uh, session at uh, JDays that uh, really convinced me that I need to go to HTTP2. Uh, that's great, but uh, what I need to do? Well, as a developer, uh, you don't need to do anything. That's the beauty of it. Uh, no change is required to your web applications. Existing web application will just work out of the box. What you have to do is you have to move to a container or server that supports HTTP2 and just deploy your WAR into that container. Then you don't even change it, you don't even recompile your WAR or whatever. Uh, not only this, but if you choose the right container, like for example Jetty, you get the push functionalities, which it's an implementation detail, it may or may not be implemented, depends on the implementation of the server that you choose. Um, you get it for free. So you know Download Jetty, deploy your one into Jetty, and configure Jetty for pushing stuff, you're done. So, super cool. Um, what do you have to do if you're a web developer? Well, maybe you gotta remove the old hacks, remove the main sharding, remove image spriting, remove um, resource inlining, and all that kind of stuff that it was only there because we needed to work around the HTTP2, HTTP1 <coughs> limitations. <laughs> so HTTP2 compliant servers require JDK 8. The reason for that is that in JDK 7, the mandatory cryptographic cipher that it's mandated to work in the HTTP2 protocol is not present. It is only present in JDK 8. So you have to move to JDK 8, and uh, you know if you follow the keynote this morning, uh, next month JDK 7 will be kind of an end of life, will not be updated anymore. So update to JDK 8, you'll get a server, a compliant server that can run HTTP 2 using the standard. The server 4.0 specification, which is under workings, uh, will support HTTP 2. So HTTP 2 will be available to um, to frameworks implementer, like for example, if you're implementing a JSF library or you know something like that, uh, you could take. You will have an API in the servlet that allows you to actually figure out if you need to push resources down to the client. Like for example, if you're you're making a component in JSF, right? You probably need like a small piece of CSS or a small background image to render that component clearly or you know nicely, or you have a theme that, that does that, and uh, and therefore your server side implementation can say, okay, I'm going to dump you down the snippet of HTML that comes with you know a small uh, background image, and um, and there you go. So. We'll see how it pans out, but you know if you have any feedback, uh, it'd be great. 
Not only this, but JDK9 has proposed for inclusion a Java announcement proposal on 110, which is an HTTP2 client API um, for using uh, HTTP2. It is actually um, like a generic HTTP API that can support also HTTP2. Uh, there is a first draft that has been out, uh, put out by Michael McMahon, which is the spec leader for, for 110. And um, it exited last week, and I haven't had time to look at it yet, but um, you know, it's a, it's a good step forward. Uh, you probably will have a native implementation of HTTP2 in JDK9. And that means both server side, both security wise, and both client side, and client side as well. So in the Java world, who is doing this? Uh, well, Jerry, um, you know, I'm biased because I, I work on that, but um, and I'm actually the implementer of the HTTP2 implementation. So um, we have server and client already. Uh, we are serving live HTTP2 at our own website, but for example, Netty, the Netty project, also has an HTTP2 implementation. I think, uh, for sure they have server, I'm not exactly sure about the client, but they probably do have also the client, because the protocol is quite symmetric and it's fairly easy to implement. Once you implement the server, you basically have 90% of the client too. Um, Undertow, the project from Red Hat, um, also is implementing HTTP2. And you have another Java client called OKHTTP that is uh, specially tailored for Android devices. And uh, you can actually use the library as a client in your Android device to make HTTP2 requests to a server. So you have many projects that are moving in this direction. So, um, you know, it's already there again in, in, this, in this case. Um, particularly about Jetty, we, what we do provide is we provide a pure HTTP2 client. So basically we offer all the low level details regarding the HTTP2 protocol uh, with API that you can use. <coughs> but not only that, what we can do is we have an HTTP client, which is a higher level API that just says, I want the HTTP semantic. I don't care how you actually send the HTTP request, which is a concept, to the server. I don't care if you send it using HTTP 101 protocol. I don't care if you send it using the fast CGI protocol. And I don't care if you use the HTTP 2 protocol format over the wire, right? It's an HTTP request. Send it whatever you want, and you know that the server will work. So, for example, this is how you configure uh, Jetty's HTTP client to be one to one new HTTP client, that's it. Uh, and this is how you configure the same HTTP client instance if you want to use the HTTP2 client transport. You just replace the <coughs> wire transport for it with this other class. So it's, it's a very simple. And then if you use Jetty's HTTP client in your application, you don't change a single line of code because once you have created this object, then you pass this object to your application and then you can use it in a totally transparent way. Today it's 1-1, one, one. tomorrow it's going, you change the configuration, it's going to be 2-0. And uh, it will just work. All right. Um, wow, I was really good on timing. Um, any questions so far? And then we'll go into the demo. Ah, you're, you're waiting for the demo. Okay, okay. Let's go to the demo. Let's see if I can figure out how to move the browser from here to there. Um, before I do that, I need to do this. Okay, and move the browser to the right window. There we go. All right, so. Um, this demo um, works in this way. It simulates a page, uh, the next page that I'm, you know, when I click on the links. It, it is going to retrieve a page uh, which is made of um, 25 different smaller images that compose a bigger image. Okay? That is to simulate a normal page that we have today in the web. A uh, page, when you download any page, you have, you know, uh, wtc.org at 41 in correlated resources, uh, cnn.com at 90 
and, and, and plus. So this one is 25, okay? Um, the thing that I've done here, I, I made a, like a small trick to my localhost interface and I slowed down the localhost interface of 200 milliseconds to simulate that there is a round trip delay uh, between the client and the server. So let's see what happens when I click on the HP101 page here. Okay. So click. Okay. Have you seen what happened? That when I clicked, there was an initial time to establish the HPS connection, you know, so the browser waited a little bit. Then the first images came down kind of slowly, but then at the end they picked up. Okay? So what is this? The, you've just seen a TCP feature called the TCP slow start. Uh, it's a feature where when you open a TCP connection, that connection is cold. And it takes a few round trips back and forward in order to make that connection warm, and then the, the server can actually send down data in a faster way. Right? <coughs> so if you open multiple connections, then you have to solve the TCP slow start problem on all of those connections. Right? So what happens if I reload this page? Look at what happens. Click. a little bit faster than before, but still, I mean, this is all non-cached, so you see what actually happens, it goes to the server every time, right? So let's go back and um, see what happens when I click on HTTP2, right? So now you're used to the timing, so I do click. Oops. <laughs> so this was not even cached, but um, it just tells you the big difference that it makes to open a single connection and make multiple extra requests to the server. TCP is will start is being resolved very easily because the exchange at the beginning is so fast that TCP is will start basically opens up the connection bandwidth immediately, like almost immediately. So this is a big benefit that you can get on your website. Um, it is actually so fast that if I